So, greetings friends. Uh, some of you, this is probably becoming familiar, um, but people who haven't seen this before, we're going to start with just a salutation to the Buddha image, um, and then some period of meditation. <clears throat> and then I'm, this evening I'm going to respond to some questions. I don't know if I say answer them, but I'll respond to them, and hopefully that will help the individuals to um, you know, formulate their specific uh, responses to their concerns. And maybe these are concerns that we share from time to time. Um, so um, there they are. Hopefully these are, this is a useful um, session for you. So <clears throat> <clears throat> Supatipanno Bhanga Vando Savaka Sangho Sangham Nama Damayam Puddhasa Bhagava Dhova Bhubhaka Namakaram Nama Namo dasa bhagavan do arahan do asamma sam 
So if your meditation this evening, I'd like you to, I suggest, <laughs> you uh, get a sense of what, what contains you, what holds you, what are your boundaries? Obviously we can say, well, when I sit here, I can feel pressure underneath me. That's the bound, that's the base of my body. Then I get a sense of there's clothes around me and there's my edges. Um, and recognize that those edges arise within awareness, which is actually is not within them, but you know, the edges, the boundaries arise within our overall field of awareness. Mm -hmm. I keep widening the reference point. The boundaries of tactile experience arise within awareness. And when we refer to the mental realm, you know, this world realm of thoughts, impressions, mental drives also, these also hold us into particular psychological situations. Circumstances. Memories, hopes, concerns, fears, um, distress. We feel very much bound in that. We may fight with it, struggle with it, try to sort it out. Could we also recognize that these arise within awareness, just widening the reference point? Because from that wider reference point, you can touch a quality of spaciousness and st stability. This becomes a very important reference point to be with experience, but not in it. To be with experience, which may be tangled, pressurized, dismal, to be with it, but not in it. So we kind of get around it. And staying in that to the point to which one can almost take your cue from that awareness, that sense of spaciousness, stability, becomes a foundation for our response to these, so these mental, psychological, emotional circumstances. So this um, place, uh, awareness, is not exactly the response, but it's a place where when, you, when your mind, your attention acknowledges that, rests in that, 
and refers to your mental conditions, psychological, emotional conditions, then a response will, can arise. And the beauty of it is that it arises by itself. So we have to wait. In that open, stable, spacious place, referring to the feeling of mental phenomena, mental qualities. And this is obviously not easy to do. Mental phenomena are exceptionally, uh, exceptionally strong pull to them, and so attracted, magnetically pulled into them. And so we might just keep referring back to primary practice body, establishing a sense of being with, but not in bodily phenomena. There's the upright quality, there's the firm basis, textures. It's not where I am, it's not an entity, it's not something that I'm inside, it's something that's within this field of awareness. Helping the mind to shift to that larger perspective, broader perspective.
So as I uh, said at the outset, we can to try to respond to a few questions. Um, basically, I'd like to have these sessions as something that can meet uh, what is helpful for you. Um, so this is why I've asked some questions. And this evening I've got a, a few. I don't know how many I will, to what degree of detail I can cover them, but because basically they fall into a couple of categories. One is a sense of, general sense of, what do I do? Frustration, other people aren't behaving properly. Yeah, so one le one question is really is much more a kind of domestic level. You know, as people I'm concerned for, uh, I have kindness for them. You know, I don't know, maybe they're her, her relatives or something. They're not getting this well, teaching. You know, and this is really valuable, and I, I can't get across to them. I think that's the question. Let's have a look again. So how do you deal with that? Um, How to behave according to the Buddha's teachings when you see people you love are suffering, you don't want to take refuge in Dhamma. You can see them as yourself in the, in the wheel of samsara. You'd like to share your spiritual path with them, but they don't want to. <laughs> oh dear, yeah. Uh, so it's in a similar vein, other people. They say we learn even from people who hurt or harm us, and they're our teachers. I think our teachers are the ones who show good examples to follow. Do we have to bear with friends when they're constantly hurting us? Um, something more full. I'm reflecting on the angry perceptions I experienced in my life and the judgment that accompanies them. Is this judgment valid or not? As a child, I felt sad and angry what I perceived as a desecration of nature by human civilization. I felt anger and disappointment of the perception of the harsh and shaming treatment of black people by some white people. I was angry as a result of the perception of the church didn't seem to take the teachings of Jesus very seriously. I felt angry and frustrated at the perception of the uncaring attitudes about the cruel treatment of animals. I felt squashed by the rigidity of the education system. I felt fear and horror at the perception of the condoning of war. And a bit later, I felt anger about the way I perceived men as a generalization to perceive and treat women. I can see there's an ethical judgment the world should not be this way. What's the matter with us human beings? We seem to want to dominate everything and sit at the top of the ladder. And what to do with these perceptions that make of me an arrogantly self-righteous judge? Isn't this just our common human inheritance we're struggling to emerge from? Um, the questioner talks about entrenched systemic patterns of hierarchy and domination don't transform out of a just out of change of heart without pressure. But what, she, what this person has seen is that applying pressure in her, in her circumstance in South Africa, they have consequences for the people who apply the pressure because it affects the heart energy. They get angry and frustrated and energy spills out all over the place. Is this really, where, you know, what do we do about all this stuff, human beings? And the, um, insensitivity and the, and the entrenched positions human beings find themselves in and they're either neglecting their own true welfare 
of them messing it up for other people. And um, somebody, of course, is asking about the current situation in the United States, which it seems to most people see is, is really, uh, yeah, it's current, but it's also, um, it's repeated and it's just coming up again, perhaps in a more emphatic and, and uh, more um, uh, broadly responded to way than in previously. And seeing all this chaos and pain and anger and violence and frustration and being met, not really being met in a very uh, um, sympathetic way, <laughs> in fact, being met with armed resistance to it. This is human conditions, human or social conditions. And, you know, well, I hope there will be quite a long conversation, uh, on, particularly in terms of the uh, citizens of the United States, but I would say it's not purely an American problem. Um, it's and I would say that even racism is, is bigger than that. It's the whole um, um, seeing other people as separate and feeling superior, feeling other, seeing other creatures as separate and feeling superior. And it sets up what I call the domination model. And, we, and it's human beings do this to everything else. Fundamentally, we do it to planet, to trees, to animals, to other human beings, to other nationalities, to human beings just to do it anything they can. They can do it to their partners, they dominate them, <laughs> do it to their kids. <laughs> and eventually they try and do it to themselves, you know. One part, of their, one part of their psyche tries to dominate and push the other part around. This is a phenomenal uh, conundrum that we see being played out in horrific terms. And how it works out on this current political social sit situation in America, I can only uh, hope that there is a lot of negotiation, a lot of conversation, and uh, a lot of people start to really listen to each other and look into their views and attitudes and grievances in a very broad and peaceful way. And that has to be the only way, because there's no other way that can lead to resolution at all. You can't dominate your way out of a domination paradigm. You can't use domination to get out of the domination problem. The problem is domination. You can't dominate people to, to, to solve it. You've got to go to the mutual field to do that. You can't, you can't respond to the problem from the very same attitude that created it in the first place. You've got to shift the attitude. And hopefully, if there is enough of this you know, peaceful, really must encourage peaceful but, but vigorous uh, uh, dissent um, or bringing this topic to the table, it may be persistent enough for people for there to be a, a, a relinquishment of domination to somewhere a bit more mutual for the mutual benefit. Unfortunately, in our history, we rec recognize that often it, <laughs> that takes quite a long while. Um, you know, we will fight and dominate and push and bully and shove and try to hold things down as much as possible rather than let go and own up. Because something about the human unawakened psyche seeks this domination apex, individuality, constricted consciousness. It feels secure, made secure by that. Uh, and this need for security is very fundamental for the human heart. And in its confusion, it thinks security can be developed through me getting on top of everything else and pushing everything I don't want out of my way. Yeah, that will make me more secure. It just makes me more domineering and the insecurity doesn't go away, as we can see. Um, you know, domination countries, huge military, huge armaments, huge anti-terrorism forces. <laughs> you know, they're not really secure at all because they have to have a massive, massive budget to maintain it. You know, it's not secure. There's a constant sense of threat. 
fending off. And the same for the embittered, embattled psyche is never made secure by power. Because you still, you don't get rid of that sense of there's bad people out there. You just build a wall against them. They're still there. You haven't made friends with them. Only when you make friends with them or make your peace with them, is it possible? That's the only way out. And it takes a while for people to get that because of this tenacious clinging that's a constricted consciousness, which is where the sense of self arises. And this is fundamentally because certain, you know, you might say it's even, you know, fundamental problems. One is sense consciousness. I'm here, I see things are out there. That's not, I'm this bit, I see things are out there, I'm separate from that. That's the way it looks. Something is out there, I can put it here, taste it, now I'm separate from it. Sense consciousness creates separation. Um, of course, it, you know, fundamentally it's not true because I can't be separate from the air around me. I, I can't be, you know, I can't be separate from the fact that there is an environment. I can shift my attention to details in it, but there will be a seen, heard, touched. Uh, as long as I'm alive, I can't be separate from that. Some will be pleasant, some will be unpleasant. You know, I'm not separate from consciousness, from what consciousness brings in. That means there's sights and sounds and people and so on going on. But the problem is, is furthered by the, the second fundamental delusion. It's created by the mind. The mind creates better for me. Better for me. You know, out of this separation and the, the subject, I want to get better. So I don't have to have the unpleasant things, the disagreeable things, the uncomfortable things, the tedious things. I can get better. The mind does that. The mind conceives of a better for me. And then you get the domination paradigm starts right there. Yeah. Now, yeah. So that model has to move from the constricted state because it is a very constricted you're really in here and holding on to what you can get in here and that tends to mean materialism get good stuff makes me happy get it in here so you get this materialist attitude all these perform a very powerful model that ends up consuming everything the planet the earth everything gets eaten up and this means, and the more I get, the better. This means other people get less. So you get inequality comes from that, from the domination model, exploitation, inequality, therefore frustration, therefore resentment, therefore violence, therefore beating down the violence, therefore walls, ghettos, prisons, bars, police, tear gas, and so forth. Now, you know, the Buddha's, this, this is, uh, aim really initially wasn't a social aim. It was, a, a, I would say, a, more like a cosmic aim. Um, in this worldview um, of that time, in the sense of there being a cosmos, which I, is a term we use to talk about um, you know, the realm of gods, or fine material realm, um, the realm of the dead, the material realm, the social realm, all fits within the total cosmos is that the complete field of what the human jitta can touch into. Psychological, cosmological, um, ethereal, as well as material and sensorial. And that's the big that's the big picture and so for people at that time all the aspects of these these realms were understood to be real ghosts spirits drama worlds you know hell realms um earth planet earth human realm society family all all there 
for it. Now we've more or less dismissed most of that. So we just have earth realm, family, yeah, is the model, except now we've added something to that called the state. And so we've sort of tweaked the cosmos, cut, cut off three quarters of it, and the last bit we got left, we've made it into something called the nation state, which then dominates us, which we subscribe to. We don't belong to the cosmos anymore, we belong to the state. We are people of the state. I'm a British person, you know, I am subject to the state. I'm not subject to the local devatas. <laughs> but in the time of the Buddha, they didn't have states. They said, you know, what's that? You know, you've got your local family, your kin, you might have the village headman, and there's a king somewhere down there who you kind of paid lip service to, but he wasn't going to bother you because he didn't really have the infrastructure to control very much. You know? So, but it made him feel good. So, okay, he's the king, but you know, you get on with your own, you're basically your stuff is dealt with in your family and you get together and the village get together and talk things over about how they want things to happen. But then everybody's still going to their shrines to respect the David, the gods and the deities to make sure they're getting enough rain. That's their cosmos. And the Buddha thought, well, even this, you know, I want to, I, I, I acknowledge that, but still, there's still something missing with the deathless because in this cosmos, everything is going to die. Everything dies sooner or later. So he's searching for the deathless. So it's a very, that's his view. He's not searching for social justice at that time. So he's out there searching for the deathless. Go to the forest. He doesn't go to the constitution. Um, but interestingly enough, through his vision, he recognizes as a fundamental principle of karma, good and bad actions, that runs right through the cosmos and actually crystallizes on this human plane as how we act towards each other. The principle of karma, the principle of ethics, runs right through the cosmos and everything is the axis of the cosmos. And if you practice with that and you tune to that, then this is, is your, your, your kind of fundamental meeting place of all these different forces is around karma, skillful and unskillful. So he's saying, well, this principle, then we can bring this into the social realm. So it comes out of the forest and starts to teach people about like generosity, uh, mutuality, uh, morality, um, you know, nonviolence non-harming, non-stealing, non-cheating, you know, he's starting to teach people this stuff. So they're going to come into an alignment with truth. So now you've got that, now you're ready to recognize where do, where do you lose all this, this true alignment, because you start to get greedy. You want more, you go to greed. So when you start letting go of that materialist craving and return back to ethics, mutuality, love and so forth and then uh, now your mind is ready to to practice the four noble truths um, dealing with this sense of the the agitation that the impact of sense experiences and the impact of course of other human beings and their behavior has on you but until you have that fundamental axis it's very difficult to really deal with the problems of human behavior, your own and others, from a clear centered place. You always ended up blaming, fighting, taking sides with one or the other, and this just causes more chaos. Now, most, most people will probably come in, nowadays will come into Buddhism through meditation, but um, they may find it surprised how much, how many teachings the Buddha gave on right conduct to businessmen, the proper way to look after your family, the way you should apportion your wealth so you share it out amongst your, your workers, you make sure everybody's getting enough to eat. It's a very sort of, you could almost communist, uh, well, at least a socialist model he's presenting you know, of, of welfare 
that if you are if you are you have some wealth you should share it if you are in a position where you have been able to be get some some advantage you share it with everybody else so they're very comfortable his advice to kings was open your treasuries and give your stuff to everybody then the criminality will cease yeah. this is many suitors or several suitors point to this model the righteous king is generous yeah. and therefore the people are happy the violence and criminality falls away um, non-violence um, so yeah, he, so he definitely taught this social model um, there's a list of the, the qualities the right for, proper king should have and they i mean they're pretty when you listen to them you try to find somebody who lives up to it you got uh, generosity uh as you look at world leaders nowadays generosity virtue self-sacrifice honesty and integrity gentleness self-control you yeah. know non-anger <laughs> non-violence patience and living in accordance with dhamma so definitely you know there's a, there is a social model being presented uh huh and yet the buddha is saying yeah this model and in fact he, he created a sangha and a, not just a sangha of, of gone forth people but also a fourfold assembly as a social model which means you've got to keep meeting and negotiating and hashing things out because all the time he's saying fundamentally this this social model is not secure you have to keep negotiating with it yeah this is why the only the best it can do is give you enough steadiness and calm and, and decent feedback from wise people to support getting out of this mess <laughs> which frankly he's saying it, it's it's you know it's a it's a rickety platform you just want it to be steady enough so you can learn to fly and that was definitely his attitude um, but he certainly put a lot of effort into creating that platform and the fundamental principle of karma so you remember the lay, lay the assembly bound by the five or the eight precepts is the standard for everybody across the board uh, mutual respect uh, and and so forth and essentially talking gathering so if you gather frequently uh, and he, he, he talked about the model of the Vajian confederation which he very much admired and model he sang on but he said they met often they came to decisions by consensus they stuck to their pledges they didn't promise thing at the election day and then not live up to it they respected their elders and they looked after their women to ensure they were safe and you know, vulnerable people girls and women ensured their safety respect to shrines and respect to spiritual elders so he said you know then these are the things you get together around and you have to hash these things out. without this you know it's not going to work So where that is not the case, you can ex very much expect the kind of experiences that these questioners have uh, talked about. And what do we do with that? So 15th chapter of the Dhammapada, happiness. Happy indeed we live friendly amongst those who hate us. Amongst hostile people we dwell free from hatred. Happy indeed we, li we live um, unafflicted amongst those who are afflicted with craving. Amidst afflicted people we, deal with, we, deal with, we live without that. We live free from avarice amongst people who are consumed with avarice. We live who possess nothing. 
we shall be feeders of joy, like radiant gods. Victory begets enmity, the defeated dwell in pain. Happily the peaceful live, discarding both victory and defeat. So that's, that's the possibility. And for this, this is the benefit of the uncontracted consciousness. You know, consciousness or awareness, uh, maybe I'm, I don't want to mix the two terms up, but awareness is the fundamental inner property of consciousness. It means the knowingness that then moves out through sight, sound, and of course, mind. So this inner quality of, of awareness can be contracted and it contracts around feeling and perception and meaning and impulses. And as it contracts, it forms responses out of those contractions. And the, and the responses are generally reactive and they become learned. I get angry, I get frustrated, I start blaming, I judge, I feel helpless, I feel accused, I feel bad. It does this, creates, it creates more contraction till we end up totally twisted and, and compressed by all this. Now, so, um, I mean, yeah, it's heartbreaking. Um, so, uncontracted, uncontracted. Um, it means trying to return to this fundamental axis of the cosmos which runs through and the Buddha talks in one of his suttas about how when people don't, when kings don't follow this, the whole cosmos falls apart. When ministers and householders don't follow this principle, the world goes crazy, the wind doesn't blow properly, the rains don't come, the crops don't grow. And this is what we're looking at now. You know? So when people are on fire with illicit passions, confused thoughts, immoral, the world goes out of sync, it affects the climate. This is what we're looking at. It's not mystical. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the duty for our own welfare and for the welfare of the planet and for the welfare of other human beings, our society, our earth, our own welfare, we've got to keep referring to that fundamental axis, which is ethical, virtuous, harmless. And that's where the sense of something slips out, something moves out of engagement in reactions that are afflictive. Ethics is the beginning of it. Uh, goodwill, sympathy comes from that. And we really keep referring to that rather than the situation. Um, for now. So it doesn't mean never, but until we can find a, a, that steady place, we're not in a fit condition to really respond accurately to the situation. Other people, there's more of them, there's only one of me, right? For any, any of us. Yeah. So it's why we say the first thing is often was word acceptance, which is but <laughs> then we accept being violated is not the case. But we acceptance means essentially that we recognize something is happening, an event is happening, a perception is happening. Whether I want it to happen or not is secondary, it's happening. It has happened, it's there. Uh -huh. Now before I say it shouldn't be. And he shouldn't, and they didn't, and they oughtn't to. I've got to stop that because that's going to throw me into the tangle. You know, so that acceptance is the recognition that, okay, it separates you from this entangled state. And the entanglement um, actually rips the cosmos apart into you and me and them. 
right? even though it seems entangling, it rips the cosmos into all these separate units. Uh, but when we come to that place of acceptance, we begin to recognize there is suffering. That's, that unifies everything. The people who are attacking me are suffering, uh, you know, um, people who I disagree with, they're, they're, in, they're in suffering as well. So we get that sense. And there's a possibility then your awareness can expand from rather than me and them into this is the situation. This is the total scenario of the human predicament at this moment. This is what we're in. We're in conflict. Okay. Now, if I start to generate conflict around that, then of course that will magnify it. So the acceptance is just to, to, to nullify the conflictive, constrictive me, you movement of the mind. Then from there, we start to, can we respond with a mind of awareness, the response that is compassionate, And compassion is the capacity to meet the unfair, the disagreeable, the wounded without reaction. Instead, it meets it with a quality of healing. Uh, so in this way, our responses, when they come out in terms of actions and speech, will come from that place of calm, dispassion and compassion, rather than righteousness, judgment, counterattack. That you know, that is the, that's the the model of the process. It's by no means um, anywhere as quick as I've just said it. Um, and generally, you have to build up. A multitude of strategies to to say, look, I just got to put that to one side because I just can't. I just get too reactive to build up enough where I can actually address this topic from a place where I'm able to talk about it and make it something that people can listen to, so we can resolve it on a social level. I'm resolving it internally. The world is not fair because the uh, you know. There is confusion, there is ignorance. With me getting upset about it is not going to make it change. This is the way out. And find the way out in one's own heart means then one is able to, from that place, address the social realm. Now, whether the social realm changes or not. Yeah. I mean, the Buddha, you can say he was one of the first peaceful protesters when his, this uh, king was going to go and wipe out the Buddha's uh, native uh, town, Kapilavastu, because they'd insulted him. The Buddha went and sat outside the gate. The king came along with his army and says, uh, let's move to one side, Lord. And the Buddha said, great king, the shade of my kinsman keeps me cool. In other words, this is my folks, right? So I'm putting myself here. I mean, <laughs> right, there's a whole art king, angry king with an army. The Buddha sits in front of the gate and says, you've got to go past me first. And the king backs off. Yeah. He did this three times. But eventually the Buddha somehow felt um, I can't do nothing I can do here. So he certainly was one of the first peaceful demonstrators, you might say, on history. And yet even the Buddha can't save people. People save people. 
you can give the teaching, we have to take it in and save ourselves. Even the Buddha couldn't save his own people from destruction. It wasn't that he didn't try. But he tried. As we can see, you know, in, in history, you know, what have we got? Some of the great peacemakers, okay, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, nonviolent, and seemed to, to some extent, in a very remarkable way, achieve or get close to achieving what he was searching for. Independent India, but he was trying to establish it on religious lines, not just fundamentalist religion, but cosmos. You know, everybody lives ethically, live frugally, sharing, you know, traditional values. And uh, frankly, that's all gone. Because people, do, if you don't keep it going, you can't, you can't do this through a law because pe the law, you can change the law. You can't do this through a political structure because you can change the political structure. You can only do this through everybody feeling and being reminded of and attuning to the cultural cosmic principle yeah. and getting it themselves. Otherwise, after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, the revolution has gone sour and the new people in charge are doing the same stuff that the people they rebelled against were doing a generation ago. Right? And it's certainly in India today, you see fundamentalism, you see brutality, you see violence, you see materialism. It's not Gandhi's India. Um, South Africa, yeah, we great stuff. Nelson Mandela. Yeah, but. Because I'm not, you know, these are great beings, but still you can't resolve this on a political level. That's why it can seem so feeble to say, oh, we just sit and meditate, you know. But it's not. Certainly, if you, if you just sit there ignoring everybody, but if you develop this unconstricted consciousness and you back it up with what the Buddha called vinya, which is our social and our behavioral practices, then you start talking, negotiating, bringing things to the table, forming skillful relationships, but you've really got to work it out at a grassroots level. It's, you're not, you're not, the system is not going to change because it's, it's a, a system that's based upon domination. It's only when the grassroots gets big enough for domination to lo no longer work that things will change. And you've got to keep it like that. Otherwise, a new domination paradigm turns up. Otherwise, we go back again because this is a very fundamental problem for human beings. Now, so social action, certainly social action. I mean, the Eightfold Path is social action. Um, peaceful protest, sure. As long as it's not, you've got to stay in line with the cosmos principle, non-violence, Non lying, non cursing, non reviling, you know, non drinking, you know, you stay with that. Whether society changes or doesn't change, or the degree which it changes, you have done your duty and you, you can feel a sense of worth and dignity and you're going to make good friends and you'll make some change what's bound to occur. That's the take on it. Um, so whether this is just your, your family circle, do your dharma. Dharma means the, the proper practices, relational practices. Find the place of disengagement where you can, you can respond to the situation from a, a place of coolness and compassion, recognizing people get confused, we get taken over by these demonic forces, and we can't be forced out of it. We have to be we have to see it for ourselves and see see a way out of it being modeled by people who sustain virtue, dignity, gentleness, but truthfulness. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I seem to have used up the time. Uh, I wanted to address or at least touch into, you know, what do you, somebody else's question about well, how do you practice when you're sick? Or, um, well, you know, sickness, directly speaking, is to do with either unpleasant feeling, loss of energy, loss of clarity, and fundamentally, awareness can embrace that. We all get sick, um, we all get tired, we all feel less than our best. And so, you, But you can feel that this is the unpleasant feeling, this is the bodily effects, this is the energetic effects, it's low, it's not firm. You place awareness on it with awareness of non-resistance and you expand awareness. Expanding means a sense of widening, softening, and a quality of goodwill. Goodwill is an expansive quality. It tends to move against separation into harmony. So you just maintain goodwill as a, as a fundamental theme that saturates the experience. Uh, and then the sickness doesn't even have to change, but you you, you lift out of it, something lifts out of it, rises out of it. So awareness on, and also be careful not to get identifying, you're not a sick person. <laughs> you know, don't make an identity out of it. Um, really, because it's not going to resolve on that level. Chitta is feeling a sense of unpleasant feeling, um, difficult uh, energies, uh, feeling of impotence, touch into the direct experience of that, aware of that, don't get constricted, contracted by that, don't feel shut in by that, instead keep expanding your awareness over the entire problem until open awareness is cool and steady and free. And from there, you begin to find the capacity to extend healing energies of goodwill. That is as good as it gets. Whether sickness elevates or not, you are no longer a sick person. You're a person whose dharma is to practice with these phenomena at this time. And... Uh, May you be well with it. May your heart be free with it. It's the only thing that can get free. With sickness, in a way, the mind can wriggle and struggle, but fundamentally there is no choice. That's its only, that's its only blessing. It's not bad karma. It's not, you know, it's, it's something that, in other words, you don't... It gives you no room to do anything else but practice that. Otherwise, you just get frustrated and miserable. You know, of course, our models of practice, we're all sitting upright, you know, healthy people in nice, clean meditation halls. And, but if you look in the suttas, a good number of the people are sick and dying even. You know, and the Buddha's saying, how are you doing? You, so the Buddha's saying, I'm not doing well at all, Lord. Miserable pains are racking my head. I feel like my belly is being carved open with a knife. It's, I'm not doing well at all. And the Buddha is saying, oh, well, bear up. <laughs> and gives him a teaching. A lot of these people were sick and really sick and no medicine. And some of them even dying. And they realize, they still realize liberation through that, in that state. So it is possible. That is possible. Health is not always possible. You know, we live an extraordinary privileged life having good health. It's, it's, not, it's not guaranteed. Uh, so, but we meet whatever it is 
you meet that the feeling don't translate it into a person I mean, you've got to keep doing it, it it's it, it's a meditation practice that's almost given to you you've got nothing else to practice with except that that makes it very direct and steady and simple may you be well may your heart be free uh, may we learn to meet the terror the problems and the struggle and the tangle of human condition with a mind that's no longer restricted by it, no longer agitated and vindictive and resentful about it, but judicious, has capacity to manifest proper dharma in this world for our own welfare and for the welfare of the future. So I'll pause there for tonight. Thank you. Andamayam Dhamma Kataya Sadhu Kalam Dadama Se Sadhu 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 Animoda So if you have a few more minutes, I don't like to just guillotine, but take any of that in while we still have some space together. Recollect that you're in a shared room here. Uh, we're listening. We're listening as a group. And sending out blessings and loving kindness as a group. Widening, softening, letting your awareness extend to your own cosmos, people near, far, thoughts, feelings, concerns. Extend, share the goodness of your heart with all of that. Any of it and all of it. So um, I do have respect towards the uh, conventions of this situation. Um, for some of you, it's pretty late, two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> if you're listening in Germany. Uh, uh, so wherever you are, it's morning, good morning, it's afternoon, good afternoon, it's evening, have a good evening. For some of us, it's good night. And uh, if conditions are supportive, the room may open again next week. Be well.